Welcome back to Unit 10, Lesson 2. This time we're going to take a closer look at the kidneys, both their structure and their function. And this video's optional. We'll be going over it in class unless you've been away. You are responsible for all of these details and they do take a bit of practice. I don't expect you to understand it right away. In class we'll be going over it in a couple different ways and activities. So to begin with the detailed structure of the kidneys, leading into the kidneys, carrying blood in that's going to be filtered, we have the renal artery. So this is blood in, or the so-called dirty blood. It will then be processed through the kidneys to eventually come out of the renal vein. And this will be blood out of the kidneys that has been filtered. So this is the so-called clean blood. Within the kidneys, you have the outer region. I'll just outline it here. And we'll be looking at an actual kidney in class so you can get a sense of the texture of this. But this outer region that I'm outlining here is called the kidney cortex. And this contains the glomerulus, Bowman's capsule, and what's called the PCT, proximal convoluted tubule and DCT, distal convoluted tubule, all of which we'll be explaining in a couple minutes here. Okay. So that's this outer region here, the cortex. Okay. Then you have these pyramid shapes. I'm going to change your color here to help draw attention to them. We'll go, let's go blue. You have these pyramid shapes that are in the middle, or more towards the middle. And they have very tidy, neat little lines. It's called striat striated appearance. And these are called the renal or kidney medulla. medulla. Medulla referring to middle. They're also nicknamed or composed of the renal pyramid because they're kind of pyr pyramid-like in shape. And these contain what's called the loop of Henley. and collecting ducts. And these are two net like networks that line up in a nice straight pattern and that's why it has this striated pattern. These then feed into these areas here. which are called calluses, which are bigger tubes collecting urine. And these all come together in this region 
they all feed into. I'm going to go back to black here so it's easier to read. Yellow is often hard to read, especially on YouTube, which feeds into what's called the renal pelvis. which collects urine. To be sent on to the ureters and bladder. And that's what this little thing here is. This is the ureter. Okay. So that's sort of the gross overview of the structure. But what we need to look at is what makes up this tissue. And they're made up of something called nephrons. Nephrons have many names. They are also known as renal tubules because they're microscopic tubes. And there's approximately a million of them, 10 to the 6, per kidney. And it's these nephrons or tubules that actually make up the cortex and medulla of the kidney. And if you look at them, they're microscopic, but if you were able to zoom in, each single one of them would have a structure like this. And you're going to repeat that over a million times over. So what I'd like to do here is just start labeling the different parts. And to sort of help you follow what's going on here, we're going to use some coloring. So we're going to start with red. And this is going to be the blood into the kidneys. some point this blood is becoming less and less oxygenated. So it's going to start becoming sort of more of a purplish tinge as it works its way through the kidney. All the meantime the blood is being filtered. as it's traveling through the kidney. And just take your time, go along, color it, picture what's happening. This is the blood wrapping itself around a tube. It's eventually going to come out. And eventually it's going to meet back up here and leave the kidney. Okay. The same time, the body starts kicking out a ton of waste. Okay. So the blood kicks all the waste out that's then going to be collected in the tube. Now the best way to understand how a kidney functions is to kind of think about a house party gone wrong. Okay, so in the blood is the house party. Everything's gone wrong. You invited 20 people, you've got 200 people. Okay, the house party is out of control. As the blood enters the kidney, it's like it's out of control. So the best way to deal with that is everything gets kicked out of the blood. Okay. So you kick everyone out of the house party. That's it. Everyone's out. And then, when they're all standing out in the lawn, you start inviting people back in. Just the ones you want. And that's how we function to actually filter our blood. We kick almost everyone, everything out of the blood, good and bad. And then, when it's out in these tubules that I'm coloring yellow, 
we then start reabsorbing things that we want back into our blood while leaving the things we don't want in the tubule. And I've shown this change in color because as it processes through the tubule, the urine will become more and more concentrated. Okay, so here we're going to start labeling what's actually going on. Okay, so leading into the kidney is the artery renal arteries. Which break down into smaller and smaller arteries, arterioles, until we get what's called the, we'll move in here, the afferent arteriole. And this is where blood goes into what's called the glomerulus. The glomerulus is this knot right in here. This is the glomerulus. And I call it a knot of capillaries. As in a knot in your shoelace. I spelled that wrong. We need a K in there. A knot of capillaries. We have a knot of capillaries and a net of capillaries. Okay, so the glomerulus is the knot. Surrounding the glomerulus is this area here where all almost everything's kicked out of the blood and captured in this. And this is called Bowman's, after the guy who discovered it, Bowman's capsule. So your house party, you kick everyone out onto the lawn. The blood party kicks everyone out into Bowman's capsule, which is also called the, whoops, also called the glomerular. Okay. Then here, this line here, we're just going to try and clarify, get rid of that. Whoops. We'll hide that line. Pretend we can't see it. So this here is called the, it's near the glomerulus, so when something is near, it's said to be proximal. And because it's all twisted, if someone t told you a very twisted story, another word for being all twisted up, convoluted. It's the proximal convoluted tubule. And we need to know all these parts because different things happen in the different parts. So P, C, T. Okay. The proximal loop, sorry, convolute tubule then feeds down into this loop here of yellow, which we call the loop of Henley. Okay. And this arm that goes down if you go down a mountain, what's the fancy word for going down the mountain? If you said descending, that's correct. It's called the descending arm of the loop of Henley, which would then make this, because the liquid's traveling upwards, the ascending arm. I tried to squish that in too much here. Okay, now that will eventually collect more and more concentrated urine into what is called the collecting duct 
of the nephron. And if you see, this collecting duct has lots of little branches off of it where other nephrons collect, and this will lead to the calluses, the renal pelvis, and eventually the ureter. Now back to the blood vessel, we had the blood entering the afferent arterial, and what's left of the blood, most of the stuff's been kicked out of the blood, but there's some proteins in that that can't cross the blood vessel wall, unfiltered, what leaves it leaves in what's called the efferent arterial. Blood out of the glomerulus. And this is partially filtered. It's not quite done. Okay, so we have partially filtered blood. And then we have surrounding the tubule, all of this, all these vessels are called the peritubular capillary network. So I talk about the knot, the capillary knot, which is a glomerulus where everything's kicked out. And then I talk about the gnat, which is the capillary gnat around the tubule where things start to be reabsorbed. And then we have one more thing that I missed here, right here. And that is the, if this was the proximal convoluted tubule closest to the glomerulus, this is the farthest convoluted tubule, so we call it the distal convoluted tubule. DCT. And I get that that picture is a little bit confusing, so we'll look at it again in a more simplified version when we explain what all these different parts do. Now, just an important point, if the kidney fails, waste will start to accumulate in the blood. in a condition that's called uremia. So you have basically the contents that are supposed to be in urine building up in blood. Now this doesn't happen very easily. It generally occurs if approximately two-thirds of the nephrons are damaged. So we really only need a third of our kidney to be functioning to actually filter our blood effectively. Which means you only need, you have two kidneys, each needs a third. You only need two-thirds of a functioning kidney. And this is why we can have living kidney donors because one fully functional kidney is more than sufficient for actually filtering our blood. So here is a somewhat simplified structure of the kidney. So rather than everything being twisted around and together as it is in reality, I've tried to show the kidney 
with the blood vessels a little more simplified, blood coming into the glomerulus, just, that's a capillary knot, and then the peritubular capillary network is very simplified. We're just showing it surrounding the loop of Henle, but not all twisted around it. Okay, and then here, we have actually the tube network, the glomerulus, that's collecting the waste and helping to concentrate the waste in the urine. It's becoming more and more concentrated throughout, so darker and darker throughout. Slightly simplified version and I'm going to show you what each part does in this simplified version. To start with, we just want to draw a line, a rough line, that separates like this. Because if we're looking at all these millions of nephrons lined up together, what we see in an actual kidney is the part above the line is what makes up our cortex. It's sort of a grainy, unorganized appearance in the kidney, and the part below is what makes up the medulla and that's that striated nice neat line portion because it's got the nice neat lines of the tubules. Okay? So here's how your kidneys function. As I said, it's kind of like a house party. Our first job, the house party is out of control. We've got people in there we don't want. We've got things in our blood we don't want. So the first thing we do is we start kicking people out or kicking things out of our blood. And that's called pressure filtration because it requires a relatively high blood pressure to actually force the stuff out. And different books will have different terms. I've picked what I think are the most intuitive combination of terms. So pressure filtration happens right here between the glomerulus and the glomerular or Bowman's capsule. So that's step one, pressure filtration. So what pressure filtration does is water, amino acids, ions, salts, glucose, urea, whoops, and uric acid. are essentially pushed out of blood through the glomerulus and into Bowman's capsule or the glomerular capsule if you prefer. So, house party out of control, we kick everyone out that we see, and then step two happens. And this is what we call selective reabsorption. So we start picking and choosing what gets to come back into the blood. Okay, And selective reabsorption is going to occur between the blood vessels and the proximal convoluted tubule. So, right there. And in particular, glucose, amino acids, some salt depending on our blood pressure, and water are 
reabsorbed into the blood out of the proximal convoluted tubule, the PCT. Now in this region, the cells lining this region, the cells have many many mitochondria for active transport because they're actually actively reabsorbing these things. And what else are they going to need to have the necessary surface area? What can we add to get increased surface area? We have them in our small intestine as well. If you said many microvilli to increase surface area for absorption or reabsorption in this case you would be correct then we have step three which occurs over here in the distal convoluted tubule and step three is called tubular excretion and it's kind of like you know when you've kicked everyone out of the house party that's gone out of control and then you ha do a final sweep and you wander through and you find oh drag that guy out of the bathtub grab that guy out of the closet throw him out well step three tubular excretion is kind of like the blood doing a final check who's in the blood that shouldn't be and let's kick it out so that's tubular excretion And again, different textbooks will have different names for this. So in tubular excretion, you have hydrogen ions. If we have excess hydrogen ions, ammonium, NH4+, plus, if you have any excess of that. If there's any creatine hanging around, cre creatinine, I should say, hanging around, any excess uric acid perhaps if you're having an allergy attack and you have histamines in your body or you're taking antibiotics such as penicillin these will all be caught up in the final sweep of the house or the blood will will be excreted from blood into distal convoluted tube. So that's the final sweep from blood into tubule, or DCT. Finally, step four, which is salt and water reabsorption. actually happens throughout nephron in particular in medulla of the kidney and it's quite a complex process and if you go look it up on YouTube you can get quite caught up in the details 
But the key idea is that wherever salt goes, water will fall. So if we want to kick the water out of the blood, we need to send the salt into the tubule. If we want to get the water back into the blood, we need to reabsorb the salt into the blood so that water will follow. Okay. So step four happens sort of across the nephron. And finally, we have step five, which is excretion, and that's going to happen in the collecting duct. So throughout the nephron in the medulla of the kidney, wherever salt goes, oh that's an interesting way of spelling wherever, okay, wherever salt goes, water will follow. So ideally, we want to concentrate the urine and not lose a ton of water in the urine. So typically, in this area here, in the medulla, we get an increasing concentration of salt. as we go down. So it's saltiest here in the medulla and least salty at the top. Which actually happens is in this part the ascending loop is kicking out salt and it's saltiest down at the bottom because it starts kicking salt out down at the bottom so you have less and less salt to kick out as you head up. So salt is being kicked out and in contrast over on this side okay, salt's being kicked out and the water is following through the ascending side and then it can be picked back up into the blood. Okay. If that's not very clear, don't worry, you can come ask me in class and I'll try and help make that make a little more sense. There are some videos I can show you, I just have to choose very carefully. As I say, many of them get too complex. Okay. The key idea though is salt and water are reabsorbed throughout the nephron. And because of this, urine typically becomes concentrated that would be the waste, the unwanted things becomes more concentrated as we progress through the tubules until it is concentrated, fully concentrated. And ready for excretion. And that's step five, is excretion. Upon reaching the collecting duct. Okay, so that's a very simplified process of how our kidneys work. Lots of textbooks represent it in many different ways. So what I've given you here is different alternate diagrams of how the nephron functions. 
some more complex than others, but it gives you another way of looking at it and considering it. Only because I know this is sometimes difficult to picture, so I've given you alternate ways to see it. As again, if you have any questions, come see me in class. And finally, we want to take a look at how the body regulates blood pressure. And we talked briefly in the circulatory system about how the body regulates blood pressure by vasoconstriction or vasodilation, making the blood vessels narrower or wider, but it also does it by altering the amount of salt and water in your blood. So we're going to take a look at that. Okay. So when we're talking about blood pressure, there's a few things we want to look at. And that is, first of all, if blood pressure is too low, which there's varying data on what that is, organs fail, including the kidneys, because they require pressure to do pressure filtration. When they're too low, it is called hypotension. If BP is too high, this is usually an indicator of poor cardiovascular health. Maybe your arteries are clogged. And they have a whole series of health consequences that we discussed in the cardiovascular system. But if it's too high, it's called hypertension. And our body is trying to maintain homeostasis, ideal blood pressure, which is approximately 120 over 80 systolic over diastolic. So let's take a look at how our body actually does this. And this is going to be a slightly messy diagram. In fact, I'm going to go put it on a whole page by itself. You guys should have room on your page to do this. So just start where you are on your page. And we're going to start with drawing the key organs involved in regulating blood pressure. So at the top of your space you have, if you want to get a separate piece of paper, a blank piece of paper to write this on and add it to your notes, you could. But I just know I have to write bigger with my computer. So we're going to draw a brain. Okay, And in that brain, we're going to have a thalamus and a hypothalamus, and in front of that we're going to have a little organ, a little gland. Okay, so this is going to be the pituitary gland. And over here we have the hypothalamus, and we're going to go into detail of what they do in a minute. And we're going to go down here. And we're going to look at the heart. Because it's going to have a role in regulating blood pressure. That's a backwards heart. The wrong side of the heart is too big. Heart. And then we're going to come down a little bit further, have our kidneys, so. so kidney with a little hat. What's the little hat about? pretty big hat on that kidney actually.
the hat or the adrenal glands and then we're basically going to zoom in to look specifically at the nephron. We're going to draw the nephron. The twisty, the knot. On this side, we're going to do the same thing. Glomerulus, proximal convoluted tubule, Lupa Henley, distal convoluted tubule, collapsing duct. Okay? So those are all going to be key to us understanding how we regulate blood pressure. Okay. So let's start with how the hypothalamus is involved. The hypothalamus is capable of detecting increased salt concentration in blood, which at first is an indicator of a lack of solvent, in this case of H2O. You're increasing your concentration you can do that either by throwing in a bunch of salt or by just decreasing the amount of water in your blood. So if you have a lack of water in your blood, you have higher salt concentration, what's going to happen to your blood pressure? Low H2O equals low blood pressure. So it's indirectly monitoring low blood pressure, which equals risk of organ failure. So what you need to do is need to reabsorb as much H2O as possible to increase your blood volume. Now this is only possible if that water's in your body in the first place, but it's going to try and reabsorb as much H2O out of the collecting ducts or out of the tubules as possible. So what it does is hypothalamus triggers pituitary gland to release what's called the anti-diuretic hormone. A D H. Okay. So a diuretic is something that causes you to actually uh, absorb less. An antidiuretic actually A D H affects kidneys. ADH causes
kidney to retain or reabsorb more H2O to increase blood pressure. Now, here's an interesting thing. When you drink, if you drink alcohol, alcohol blocks ADH release. So think about this. If you are capable of absorbing more water, you urinate less. But when you drink alcohol, you don't reabsorb as much water, so you urinate more, not just because you're drinking liquid, but because you're not reabsorbing the water as effectively. And you end up with that effect of a hangover where your body's dehydrated because you've urinated out all the water instead of reabsorbing it into your system like it's supposed to be. Now let's look at another spot where our body regulates blood pressure or monitors and regulates blood pressure. Okay. And that's within the nephron itself. Okay. So the nephron can monitor blood pressure. It can sense the blood pressure, and if blood pressure is too low, the kidney itself releases renin. Renin is a hormone, so it releases it into the blood. which converts this inactive hormone called angiotensin into and oops sorry into angio Tensin one and then angiotensin two, and it's the two that we're concerned about. Okay. Oops, sorry. I just need to get this down. Okay, so we're concerned about angiotensin 2 because angiotensin 2, also abbreviated AG2, then influences blood pressure in two ways by it acts as a vasoconstrictor just draw an arrow up to the nephron and the glomerulus so it acts let's put AG2 up here in case we lose track AG2 acts as a vasoconstrictor for kidney blood vessels and it also causes
neutrino gland. To release aldosterone. Which is another hormone. AD, not to be confused with ADH, to cause. I'm just going to continue this over here. Cause kidney. Sorry for the messiness. It's a bit challenging. To reabsorb salt and H2O and thus increase blood pressure which is the response we wanted this was all triggered by low blood pressure okay so the two things we've talked about one is ADH coming from the brain regulating an increase in blood pressure. The other is renin angiotensin II and aldosterone coming from the kidneys and cause or the adrenal gland and causing an increase in blood pressure. But we also have to regulate blood pressure getting too high and this is where the heart comes in in our last mention of stretch receptors. In the heart there's atrial stretch receptors. that detect increased blood pressure and cause the heart to release atrial natriuretic hormone ANH now I'm just going to warn you right now. You need to know AD, ADH, angiotensin II, renin, and ANH, and not confuse their functions. Okay? So it releases ANH, which inhibits aldosterone. and renin. Oh, I don't know what happened there. Let's see, can I undo that? There we go. Osterone. And renin. And thus decreases blood pressure. Okay? So that's the key ways that we regulate blood pressure. And just while we're here, I want to take a quick little note on what a diuretic and a naturetic are. So we'll just write here. Diuretics do this without hitting buttons with my arm. Diuretics prevent H2O reabsorption into blood which equals more urine and sometimes bodybuilders will take these or people who need to lose weight basically what they're doing is they're severely dehydrating their body but bodybuilders who in particular if they use steroids through that and cheat they tend to retain water and then when they want to get that lean cut look they'll take diuretics to 
get rid of water out of their system and sorry that's naturatic they sort of use a combination of the two so naturatics they prevent that H2O reabsorption into blood and that equals more urine and diuretics similarly equal more urine but they increase pressure filtration and this is why they're good for getting rid of excess water in the body increase pressure filtration so that more water is forced into urine equaling again more urine so that's what for example if you take caffeine a lot of people who consume caffeine find they have to pee more and they're more dehydrated and that's because you're actually forcing more water out of your blood into your urine and then if you take a naturetic on top of that it won't be reabsorbed very effectively okay so that's how your body regulates blood pressure here we have a chart which is a summary of blood filtration and urine formation in the kidneys and what we're looking at is trying to explain how the different processes work so just to clarify here glomerular filtration depending on what you're reading and on your notes is also called pressure filtration tubular reabsorption is what I've simply called just reabsorption so selective reabsorption they are the same selective reabsorption okay and tubular secretion and this is the one that I don't like is the same as tubular excretion and in your guys's copy of the notes you will find I've used selective reabsorption pressure filtration and tubular excretion because I think these two terms are slightly less confusing and what I'd like you to do here is fill out this summary table based on what we've described okay if you have any questions please feel free to come see me I hope you have a good day and I'll see you in class